Hi, my name is Connor and I am a structural engineer in training in Canada. When I tell some of my colleagues that I use Python in my work as a structural engineer, they sometimes ask, well, what do you use Python for in structural engineering? This is a difficult question to answer on the spot because it's ultimately just using a computer and it's kind of like asking, what do you use a computer for in structural engineering? So this is my answer to that question. This is also a video in homage to the video done by Dr. Becky Smethurst, where she showed how she uses Python in her work as an astrophysicist. I saw her video and I really liked it, and so I thought I would do something similar for structural engineering. So I'm gonna show five examples of how I've used Python in my work, and hopefully it gives you some ideas on what you can use it for. Ultimately, how you use Python in structural engineering is really only limited by how much you use your imagination. So let's jump into some examples. Here, I'm using the new JupyterLab desktop application to show you how I use Python to manipulate files for analysis. The idea here is that instead of having to open up individual files and create files manually in a graphical user interface, you can create files off of a base file and create multiple versions very quickly instead of having to manually change every bar. Here, this is the section I'm gonna be looking at, the reinforcing bars. First, I'll import pathlib, which is part of the built-in Python standard library. It's an easy and convenient way of manipulating file paths. I'm gonna first off create a path to my CTI file, mycall.cti, and we'll check to see if it exists before going further. We see that it does, so let's continue. I'm gonna start by creating a variable called new area that's gonna have my new bar area. I'm also gonna create a new variable called new file name where I create a new file name because I don't wanna overwrite the existing file, I wanna have new files. Oh, there's a plus in here that I don't want, so we'll just delete that, and that's what I want my new file to look like. So that we've printed it out, we know that this part of the code is working, so let's continue on. I'm gonna open up two files. The first is gonna be my call.cti and then also the my new file name. So I can open one and write to the other at the same time. So we need to find out if we're in this bar section here as we iterate through the lines in the file. Reinforcement bar starts with the heading reinforcement bars and ends with the heading factored loads. So we're gonna go through every line in the file and if we are in if we see the heading reinforcement bars, then we'll say we're in the bars section. Otherwise, if we hit the blind factor loads, then we'll say we're no longer in the bars section. So now if we're in the bars section and there's a comma in the line, meaning that we see a line of data of area, X coordinate, Y coordinate, we're gonna split that apart into each of its constituent pieces. Then we're gonna rejoin it back together, but instead of putting the area and the X and the Y coordinate, we're gonna put the new area there. So we've got to, indent this back and let's take a look at the code here and if I run this then I should see my call 500.cti be created and I do here. Let's try creating another file with 700 millimeters squared. Note that I've now just created two files without having to manually go in and change the size of each bar. Let's go down and make sure that this worked. Yep we see 500 there and this is our original where we see a thousand. Let's look at the same of our 700 millimeter squared. Yep same here. Ultimately now we need to know if this is going to open up an SP column. So let's open up SP column and open up our one of our files. Let's start with 500 millimeters squared and we can see that indeed it recognizes it as having 1425 M bars. We run the analysis and we see that 25 M is too small of an amount of reinforcing so let's try instead our 700 millimeters squared file and we'll see the analysis runs. Now, ultimately, you wouldn't just be creating individual scripts here to change just one attribute of the file. You'd want to create a library that does, it can manipulate multiple parts of the file for you all at once. Welcome to doing calculations with HandCalcs and Jupyter. With Python, we can do normal arithmetic operations like we would do in Excel. We can set variables and then print output results. However, if we wanted to print all the intermediary valuables, we have to add all these print statements, A equals B equals, etc., and then we just even still see results. However, these are not very um, adequate as engineering notes. 
there's a reason that hand calculations are considered the gold standard is because it's easy to follow someone's train of logic and to make sure that there's no errors in the actual calculation. The library hand calcs is a library that I've written to do just that. It renders calculations in Python as though you'd written them by hand. You can see here, we see the variable names, the symbolic formula, and then also the numeric substitution before we see the result. If we break it up into two separate lines here where we have inputs and formulas, we can see that again, the numeric substitution and then the result. We can add the params tag here to make the parameters all in one line. This is rendered in LaTeX in the browser using the Katek extension developed by Khan Academy. We can also do calculations with um, units by using the Units Aware Library for All People. This, we're going to load up the structural environment and say that we want all of the units variables in the top level namespace. So let's go ahead and use JupyterLab for some calculations so you can see what I mean. We'll use percent percent %render to say that we want to render this cell with hand calcs. We're going to set some variables. Let's just look at doing uh, some plate bending. Let's say we're going to set B, the width of our plate, D, the depth of the plate, and FY is going to be our yield strength of our steel. We don't want to see these substitutions, so we'll use the params tag here. So we'll explain what we're doing in our calculation using markdown in the Jupyter Notebook. We're going to do plate and bending. So we'll start with percent percent render. The, we're going to calculate the elastic mod, section modulus. Then we're going to calculate MR. Oh, I forgot to include the phi factor, so let's include it there. Notice how the phi is rendered in Greek letters. So we'll calculate the moment resistance of our plate in bending, and you can see here that the units have been canceled out and converted into kilonewton meters because that's how they're dimensionally correct. So here's an example of a larger calculation sheet you can do using hand calcs and Jupiters. You can set up an input cell and then render those inputs as you need them. You can create section headings. You can even explain where you got your formulas from and include links to outside documents. Here we can use if and elif statements because codes often require different calculations for different conditions. And as we go down, we can see that we're going to calculate the factored moment resistance of our plate in bending, taking lateral torsional bending into account, and we can see our demand capacity ratio at the bottom here. So let's go in and change one of our inputs to see if we can use a 30 millimeter thick plate instead. Let's scroll all the way to the bottom and we can see our DCR is now over one. That is not going to work. So let's just change it back to 35 millimeters. So once we've completed our calculation, rerun everything from top to bottom, we can go ahead and export it as an HTML document because this is using the uh, HTML rendering capability of Katek. It renders as an HTML document that we can then open up in our browser and even print to a PDF. Here's what the rendered document looks like. Note how we don't have any input cells showing. Here is what the PDF preview looks like from our browser. And then we can just save that. And now we've got our an, an addition we can put into our engineering notes for this particular member. Let's open it up and take a look at it in Bluebeam and see what our final product is. And here we go. And as I mentioned, you can still link to outside documents and pull that up. So if someone's reading your notes and wanting to know where your formula is from, they can see that this is indeed where you got it. So while Excel is dominant in our industry, I encourage you to try using hand calcs because it is much faster to put together a beautiful looking calculation sheet. Speaking of Excel, I'm going to show you some table operations using pandas. This is some analysis results of a model. We've got two levels and four points where we're going to be looking at nonlinear time history analysis results, time series at these eight locations. Each of those eight locations has eight different ground motions here and with six different degrees of freedom. Here's what we're going to be looking to do at the end of it is to see for each result at each location, we want to calculate the drift, which is going to be taken as the maximum of each ground motion. This is an analysis done in SAP, and because it's done in SAP, we do not have access to a drift calculation within the software, so we have to do it manually. Here's what the raw data looks like coming from SAP. As our CSV file, we've got eight different ground motions here, and there's some 660,000 lines of data. Rather small as far as time uh, history analysis is concerned. So let's open up our CSV file and read our data. 
Here is what it looks like. This is the head of our data, the first five rows shown in pandas. Here's what we're going to be doing. Since we have one long table, we need to be able to split this table into multiple pieces, a table for the roof joints and a table for the level two joints. Once they're stacked beside each other instead of on top of each other, we can then subtract the roof displacements from the level two displacements and calculate our U1 delta. To do this in Excel would require some manual work and would be tedious to do over and over for multiple analyses. Using pandas, we're going to create a data pipeline where we can process the table all in one go. And so to rerun this for multiple iterations will be painless. So we're going to start by taking our joint ID, which is currently encoded in one string where we say the joint is called level two northwest or roof northeast. We're going to split those up into a level column and an ID column. So each of those names will have their separate components stored in the table. Now we've got to split the table into two tables based on their level. So the joints that are at the roof level will be one table and the joints that are at level two will be another table. Now we can merge these tables together into one table, but instead of them having being stacked on top of each other, they're going to be stacked beside each other. You can see on the left here, we've got the X data, meaning the roof data. And on the right here, we've got the level two data, the Y data. Now, because we've got U1X and U1Y in the same row, we can subtract the U1X from the U1Y for each time step. Now we're going to get the absolute value of each of those deltas, and now we're going to find the max. We can then group the results by their joint ID, their level in the building, and also their output case, their ground motion, to get the maximum for each ground motion in the table that we want. Finally, we can add a column for the height of our stories and calculate our drifts, which will now represent the maximum drifts for each ground motion at each location. So let's out this, output this to Excel. Here we can see we've just called the to Excel method on our data frame, and we can even launch the Excel file from Jupyter. Now, if we need to do this again for another file, it's just a matter of opening it up and running the script from top to bottom with the new file name. A structural engineering activity that's not on the design side is reviewing concrete test reports during construction administration. These can be quite tedious, especially if there's going to be hundreds on a particular job. These are all in PDF format typically and require manual review to make sure that the concrete that gets poured is in fact the concrete we expect as per the design. What if there was a way to do this analysis with Python and in a way that didn't require us to have our eyes crossed looking at lots of tedious lines of data? Here, I've created a library called Concrete Reports. The functions in this library read PDF reports produced by certain companies. Different functions are required to be written for each different company's reports because they're all in different formats. Here, I've got a directory full of concrete test reports and I am reading them in an automated fashion and from each file, I'm taking the data from them and putting the data in the file into their own separate row in a pandas data frame table. In essence, for each report, we're creating a new record and putting all those records into a master table so I can review all PDF reports at once. Furthermore, we're going to be able to view the reports and the results of the reports graphically so we can see at a glance if there's any reports that need to be reviewed more carefully or if we can just see that they're okay. Here we can see the plots of the results of our analysis. The red bars that you see are the expected strength of the concrete that's been placed. The gray bars that are transparent and overlaid on top of the red bars are the actual test results at different days. So if we see red, we know that there's likely a problem that we need to look closer at those reports. If we don't see any red peeking through, then test results have surpassed the expected strength of the concrete. Last is section analysis with section properties. There's a growing community of structural engineering programmers that are putting out excellent industry grade software that is free and open source. In my opinion, I think section properties is one of the top. 
Here we're going to do an analysis of a section of a W section where we've got it loaded in torsion and let's say that the deflection is a little too great and so we decided to put a plate onto one side of it to give it more torsional rigidity. Using section properties we're going to start off by creating three different materials. We're going to have the W section that steals 350 MPA, the steel at 300 MPA for the plate and steel 490 MPA for the weld. Here's what each section looks like. The W section, the large rectangle, which notices sideways, and now we can show the fillet as well, which is just a triangle. So let's put these pieces together. We're gonna to build up the section from each of these primitive pieces. The W section, we're gonna to align to the centroid, and then we're going to align the stiffener, the uh, rectangle, to the side of the W section. By using the plus operator, we can show both shapes together. We've rotated the plate, we've aligned it to the centroid, and then we've aligned it to the right of the W section. For the top weld, we're going to do something similar. We're going to align it to the right of the W section and then to the top of the stiffener. And when we add it into our compound section with the plus operator, we can see it. Same with the bottom, we're going to take the top weld, rotate it negative uh, 90 degrees, and align it to the bottom of the stiffener. Now we can add them all together and see that we have the shape we want, and so let's assign that to our composite geometry. We're next going to create a finite element mesh of a maximum area of 5. When we plot the geometry, we can see that a hole has automatically been recognized by section properties. Now we can add it to a section and calculate the geometric and warping properties. Now the analysis is complete and we can see the plotted shear center at its location. We can also use the .getSC method to get the location of the shear center and coordinates. We can use getJ to get the torsional uh, modulus and get gamma to get the warping constant, which is CW in the Canadian code. This is only a tiny piece of what section properties can do for you. And I highly recommend taking a look at it and learning how to use it. So that is just a little bit of how I use Python in structural engineering. If you're an engineer that uses Python as well, I'd be loving to hear what you do and how you use it. Please let me know in the comments. Also, if you're a structural engineer that's interested in learning Python for the purpose of structural engineering, also let me know as well. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video. Take care.